I think every man, every woman should have a kettlebell at home. And if you want to get a, a sling trainer, that would be a good idea too. What I realized, let's say you come to me and you stay stay with me at Bang Tao for a month. We're going to achieve some of those goals. And then you go back home, life kicks back in. You have different priorities, which are very likely not training twice a day. You have a job. So I used those two tools and primary the kettlebell to teach you, educate you, help you to buy a kettlebell at home. Then when you went home, you can continue your training. <laughs> Welcome back. This is part two. Enjoy the episode. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's let's frame those energy systems first. So we have three energy systems. Very important up front. They all always run at the same time. So the human body is, is not a linear system. It, it's very complex. And it's not if you do one exercise and then you switch to the other exercise. Or let's let's say you do strength training and you do marathon running. It's not that you only use the one energy system and here's a clear line when it switches to the next one. So they all run at the same time. You and me sitting here, all three energy systems run at the same time. The only difference is, depending on what we do and its intensity and its duration, that one energy system is going to be more dominant than the other two. That is what is happening. But everything is running at the same time. Anyway, so three energy systems. Number one, we call it the electric system. Um, where you use ATP, which is called adenosine triphosphate. Mm -hmm. Very likely you pronounce it a little different in English. Yep. And uh, creatine phosphate. That energy system, the, or those energy sources, ATP and creatine phosphate, CP, are immediately available. And to give an idea of where you use them, it would be typically a 100-meter sprint. So that energy system kind of lasts... 10 seconds and less. This is when lactic acid's kicking in, essentially. Uh, no. Oh, okay. No. So uh, that would be the, the, next, the next energy system. Okay, but okay. you got a 100-meter sprint, you go all out, high intensity. After that 100 meter, you might be able to continue running, but not with the same intensity. Or let's say we talk about uh, strength training. I tell you to do a one repetition max deadlift. There is no second rep. Not because you're tired. It's not that you lie on the ground and you can't move anymore and your, your, heart, is, your heart will beat after very high, but it's because your, your ATP is gone. It's just there for three, four seconds okay, for that one rep. So we can train those energy systems by doing exactly this. Um, I like that kind of training, but it's very boring for everyone else. Let me explain you why. A rule of thumb, or let, if you talk about track and field athletes, Let's say they want to they wanna work on the 100 meter time and they sprint. They're going to sprint 100 meter with a max effort. Let's say they assume, they imagine this, those are the Olympic Games, right? I need to win all out. For every 10 meters you sprint, you rest one minute. That's a rule of thumb. That means if we go to the track and we sprint all out, we rest at least for 10 minutes, at least, to do it again. Because what we're training right now would be electric power. So we want to have, in a short amount of time, the highest output. So we need to rest. We need to fully recover. If you don't do this, you could do, let's say, intervals. Let's say we run 50 meters, 75 meters, and I don't let you fully recover, um, but it's still a very high intensity. That would be electric capacity. So I train you to work for a longer duration of time on a very high intensity level. Yeah? But again, there's a very, very fine border because very quickly we move on to the next energy system, which would be the lactic energy system, or also called uh, glycolytic energy system, where we move, uh, we use dominantly the sugar stored in our muscles, so glycogen. Mm. And um, that lasts for let's say 30 to 90 seconds. So before we jump into yeah. the glycogen mm -hmm. uh, aspect of that, now that part I'm going to understand. Um, can you detail a little bit more now on the first energy system? We're, 
tapping into ATP. This is the energy source. Yeah. So I, I'm going to understand the, the next ones will be we're tapping into the sugar, into the glycogen, and probably the third is the fat. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And I understand the fats. Uh, actually, you're, it's like things like ketosis. When you go into those states and you're, it's, you're accessing, accessing that, it's running through the bloodstream. Um, but before we go there, yeah. where, how, how does scientifically or the best, if you can explain that, ATP, where is that accessing from? It's a sugar, it's in the muscle fiber. How does that work exactly? So we store that in our muscle. Okay. And you can just store a certain amount, okay? It's there. And for every muscle contraction, every muscle contraction, you use ATP, okay? We have a muscle contraction. ATP then becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So there's one phosphate missing. And then there's a, we don't want to go too deep, but then yeah. there's a recovery cycle where we use uh, a phosphate from creatine phosphate to put another phosphate on ADP to make it ATP again. Got and it. that takes some time. That's why we need to rest, for example, for those 100 meter sprints. Or if you see a power lifter who lifts heavy, they sit around for five, six, seven minutes to do the same weight again, right? So we replenishing the ATP. Same happened with glycogen, sugar, and fat. So it's not that you burning fat to, to have energy. We're using fat and oxygen to produce ATP. And then we use again ATP to, to contract the muscle um, for, for the performance you're doing. So it's always ATP. So this is, again, always maximum strength, <laughs> max PR. And, and that's why they say a lot of these Russian Olympic lifters... Um, when they are, let's say, training in the gym. Mm -hmm. And um, like, okay, so for example, for myself, um, I used to do, um, let's say, I would never do leg day, but I would do like um, leg, like heavy, the focus would be on the legs that day. Mm -hmm. So it would be, okay, I'm going to do five, r five sets of squats and they're back squats. Well, maybe I have four or five other exercises after, maybe one's calves. Um, but I'm not, I probably won't go to the, do the hack squat. Actually, I'll probably go do a little light back high repetition, but the main focus is the legs. Yeah. So I would do, um, let's say week one would be, um, six reps. Then the next week would be five and then four and three and two, and then maybe one. So it's like, I, I'm, I'm adding weight each week, but on those days, even when I'm doing five repetitions, um, and I'm doing five sets. I would be taking three to four minute breaks between each set. And I've always, I never questioned it, but mm -hmm. I, this was from the program I was reading. It was by a guy named Jeff Nippard. And that's because I'm accessing my, using my AT, ATP energy source. So when I'm basically, I would go to, uh, let's call it 80 to 90%, never a hundred yeah. between those sets. Is that the example of where I'm accessing my ATP energy source? Well, so you always, as I said before, you always access the ATP and all energy systems run at the same time. Okay. And as long as your ATP or the first um, energy system can handle that, then it just runs through that. Okay. But like I said, it's uh, don't get caught up because they all run at the same time. So for example, while you're resting, that ATP has to be replenished, as I said, right? The better your uh, aerobic capacity is. So um, you, you, you know aerobic capacity, yeah. so it's not just steady state training, but if you have a really good um, aerobic capacity, if you do a lot of low intensity steady state training, that will actually help you in the weight room because that energy system, if it's good and well trained, will help you to restore the ATP quicker than someone who's not doing this at all. Uh, so again, now on the uh, the aer aerobic, aerobic, aerobic this, yeah. this is like, is this uh, like uh, different than becoming anabolic? Anabolic's more like you're building muscle constantly. These yeah. are completely two different concepts. That, that is even a, a complete different topic. Okay. So yes. there's anabolic and catabolic. One okay. means you build and, one and the other means you, you, uh, you're losing. And that can be let's say you exercise too hard, let's say you do high-intensity interval training every day and uh, you're not able to recover from it because your sleep is not enough, you're not eating enough, your body at one point comes into a catabolic state and 
you you lose your muscle mass as a like source of energy to atro uh, atrophy muscle at atrophy, atrophy, atrophy yeah muscle to atrophy, to balance yeah. out the uh, the missing calories you're not getting from yeah. uh, from eating too uh, enough or okay so I, I won't get yes. I won't get us too yeah, spun yeah, yeah. around there um mm -hmm. i've had a couple of coffees and uh yeah it's been so a, it's a quick morning so let, let's go back to to uh continuing on the three um energy sources and we'll jump back into the glycogen and en energy source yes uh explain that a little bit more so too. so we had the the proper strength training high intensity very short time or a sprint high intensity short time 100 meter is our atp and creatine phosphate then the next one is what most of us do in the gym when we do, uh, for example, GPP is called general physical preparation, um, and you do your strength circle, you circuit, you walk from one station to the other, and you keep lifting, and there's a little bit of uh, rest in between, and you're not lifting too heavy. That's probably what you did in the gym. Yeah, um, that works very well on that um, on that lactic energy system. Now. Uh, the question I think you had the last time on that birthday when we when we yeah. when we were drinking a, a beer together was if lactic acid is what makes you feel that burn in, in your muscle, right? Um, so I wanted to talk about this a, a little bit. So while we're exercising in that intensity range and in duration range, there is uh, a byproduct called lactic, right? You can call it lactic acid, but it's actually not acid. Like it's not from it's a not battery a, that b burns and it's, and you. And it's you know? not acidic. No, it's not acidic. Yeah. Lactic is, or lactate, uh, I hope I pronounced it right, lactate is actually a great source of energy that your aerobic system can use and form as an, as an energy source. Now, there is a bite product called hydrogen. So if the intensity of your strength training and the rest time gets shorter and shorter and, and your training becomes longer and longer, your aerobic energy system is not able to clear the lactic or the lactate and the hydrogen as an energy source, right? And so it accumulates and that's what then gives you that burning sensation. And that fatigue steps in, which is just a, a safety mechanism of your body because your body has to stop you somehow, so you start fatiguing, and the hydrogen, that byproduct, is what makes that burning burning sensation. And we were talking about that with Shah as well and explaining how that carries over into people that are doing the 100-meter dash. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've trained hard enough. Maybe I have, I haven't noticed, but uh, explaining w how do we know when we are you know, lactic or we're releasing lactic acid? Is there a certain feeling that one could describe? Um, absolutely. So for everyone who wants to try it, uh, a typical running distance, sprinting distance, distance would be a 400 meter sprint. Or if you have access to an assault bike, right, the Airdyne, just go all out on that. So if you, if you anywhere between, um, let's say on the assault bike, it might take you 30, not more than 45 seconds to get that feeling, sprinting, going all out. If you do the 400, if you're very fast, you're somewhere under a minute. Uh, you and me were somewhere above a minute, so let's say up to 90 seconds. But if you really try... Oh, thanks, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. If you really try to hit the finish line as fast as possible, um, the last... That's what happened with me. The last 10, 20 meters, I'm still good. My arms are still swinging and I feel I'm still fast, but I, I can feel my legs almost collapsing. It almost feels like you start running on soft sand. And your legs cannot follow up your arm action anymore, and it, you just you're just stopping. And then once you hit the finish line, you sit down. You feel you feel that burn, and you it's the worst feeling ever. Mm -hmm. Is that a good state to reach? And what are the benefits of reaching that state? <clears throat> well, it is definitely a good state to reach if you're competing. Like you should feel that, and uh, it also shows you where is your where are your limits pretty good to know the limits to know what limits do you want to cross what where we want to push right uh, it's definitely not something you should do every day like an intensity like this um, where you let's say almost fall off the assault bike or 
lie on the on the running track, uh, gassing for air and, and having this burning sensations. If you want to do it, do it once a week okay. or every now and then. But it's not something that um, helps you to reach your goals in an efficient way. It's very stressful on the body. And uh, doing it every day, you will not be able to recover from it and you will come in that catabolic state we were talking about. Is there any difference or, or is it proven that the the better opportunity or chances to maybe burn body fat, could it be through interval training? Could it just be from heavy lifting? Um, could it be long distance running? Could it be sprinting? Um, have you heard anything about this on which one might be better for if someone is lo looking to burn fat, essentially? Yeah. Um, so as I said, the, the high-intensity interval training became very popular, um, and it has its place, but not more than a week. W uh, not more than once a week. Like, don't do it, especially, especially if you're not a high-level athlete. Um, so you can do that once a week, definitely, but when it comes to losing body fat, um, most people not only want to lose body fat, they actually want to change their body composition. So they want to lose some fat, maybe build some muscle at the same time to, yeah, to look better and to minimize the, the health risk or the issues they already have with being overweight. So when we just talk about the energy system, and then the last system, uh, the aerobic system would be the number one when it comes to just burning fat. So you would do uh, medium to very low intensity training. That could be intervals. It doesn't need to be steady state training. You walking or jogging for an hour. That doesn't need to be that. You could do intervals, but with a very uh, low heart rate. Yeah? And a consistent low, like you're talking 110? Um, so there are in total three things you could do uh, in that energy system. You can develop the energy system when it comes to your aerobic capacity. Developing means the intensity has to be a little higher, right? You have to push that threshold. There we talk about more or less 85% of your max heart rate. So let's say I'm 32, make it easy. You take 220 minus 30. So my max heart rate is round about 190. You take 15% off, which is, let's again, make it easy, 25 beats down. So I'm somewhere around 165. Yeah, I want to... Do that for intervals or for a longer duration of time to develop that system. Mm. Maintaining that system would be, again, every book gives you uh, different numbers, but let's say 75% of your max heart rate, then you are somewhere around 145 beats per minute. And if you want to use this energy system for recovery, let's say you're an MMA fighter, you train very hard all week, um, you can jump on the bike or have a light jog on a heart rate that is on let's say 65% of your max max heart rate. And there we're talking about 110, uh, 10, 120 beats per minute, which is uh, very hard to keep because yeah. you get that heart rate up very, very easily. Yeah, but I find 110 is pretty, for me, yeah. jogging. 110, 120, after when I'm hitting 140, 150, like I can probably only do that 30 seconds. Like it's quite high, one, 150, yeah. like... I, I'll have the watch on and I'll be looking. And when, when yeah. I hit about 150 and I'm going quite hard, it's it's hard to maintain that, I find. So that would be, for, for example, a good sign for you to have the idea to develop that mm. aerobic system. Um, when I do a light jog, it's 140, 145. A light jog? Like yeah, a light jog. Mm. Like, but I'm trained in a way that the sport I'm playing is very intense so the moment I'm warming up, my heart rate goes up already. So my, my body is conditioned for that. Is that a good thing? For my sport, yes. Mm. Um, if you ask me to run a marathon, I struggle. <laughs> you know, because um, I could run now, let's say a half marathon, 20K. Uh, I don't want to say it's no problem. But the first 10K, the first half, I'm struggling because my heart rate is way too high. I'm not economic. Um, yeah. yeah. But no. that, is, that is definitely a sign that you could improve that, that area. So is this why uh, at Bangtao MMA, Muay Thai and MMA, yeah. they will structure kind of their morning, I, I guess you could label them as hit classes, but throughout the week, there are different intensities. Meaning like on Thursday, which is maybe why I did, didn't go today. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was, it was raining crazy. I was a bit busy too. Yeah. But um, on Thursday, it's very intense. And Friday, it's, it's less intense. But throughout the week, 
they're not kicking your ass 100% <clears throat> intensity every day. Are they structured because they've brought that mentality or that school of thought into the organization of those classes? Yeah, absolutely. So every class from Monday to Friday has a structure. And on those days, like if we have a morning class, a midday class, an evening class, those three classes won't be the same intensity. Yeah, or we, we try not to utilize the same energy system or the same exercise. You're not going to deadlift at 7 a.m. and you're not going to deadlift again at 5 p.m. So we obviously try to provide a service to our customers so they can come maybe twice a day, every day. I don't want, I don't want you to come in on Monday, do three high-intensity sessions, die, and then I see you again on Friday. Or even worse, you maybe exhaust yourself so much that you start getting sick. So... Um, Slow and steady is, is always the key to su success, right? Yeah, I find that, and I kind of naturally, st I mean, I've been doing it pretty uh, regularly for Absolutely. at least three months now. Uh, I took a week off. I just felt depleted, to be honest, and I just needed to rest. And I think there was a cold going around. But um, I find on those classes, like some days, like if I know, for example, if I know Thursday is going to be intense, on Wednesday, even though other people might be going harder, I've kind of like okay, I, tomorrow I'm going to push myself, I know. So today, do do the class, but, I mean, yeah, just take it down a notch a little bit. <clears throat> and is, is that something that, that you would recommend to people training, you know, five, five six days a week? Absolutely. Um, and, I mean, that is great that you can do this, and I would say that shows that you are advanced and that you can feel and listen to your body. Um, because no matter what is written on the whiteboard – you know best what is going on in your life. Maybe you didn't sleep good last night, you have stress at work, whatever is, is making you recover a little slower. Number one, and, and, uh, and number two, there's still that mentality going around, uh, go hard or go home, which is just not a good idea. You can't conquer the world every day. That doesn't mean you cannot su train successfully. Yeah, you're 100% from yesterday, I'm maybe here, but you're 100% today, are down here. You cannot always compare yourself of how hard did you train yesterday or last week. You got to listen a little bit to your body and then still make a quality session. And that might be taking some plates off your barbell or just go a little, a little slower in the intervals. Yeah, and the key is sleep. I mean, that, that's, I used to measure my sleep a bit. And it, it's like anything you measure, like you measure your food, your macros. Yeah. Once you get used to it, yeah. you know when you didn't get eight hours or seven hours. You just feel it. And um, I kind I do listen to that a bit, so I don't kick my ass. Um, let's move forward into the king of the kettlebell. Mm. And recently, um, you ran a kettlebell class. I believe that was two, three weeks ago. And that was uh, talk. talk I, I won't ask the question too much, but just talk a little bit about what were those sessions? What were you doing? And now you're introducing another kettlebell um, class. Plus, it's coming out at Bangtown Muay Thai and MMA. How did this all come together? Why are you the king yeah. of the kettlebell? So, um, okay, let's start like this. We have to go back a little bit of why the kettlebell actually. So, uh, first of all, I want to say I don't think the kettlebell is superior to any other training tools, right? If you want to be the strongest man in the world, there's no way around the barbell. If you want to build a big amount of muscle to compete maybe in a bodybuilding competition, bodybuilding style training and using machines where you can isolate a certain muscle is, is the right way to go. So, Oh, sorry, continue. I always just check out. Okay. The, I check out your, uh, uh, the framing to make sure it's right. Yeah. Okay, so, good. so they are, they are tools. And yep. me as a coach, I have to uh, use the right tools for your goal, okay? So which brings us to the first important thing. I, you need a goal to aim for, right? And I had uh, holiday people coming to me, and most of them had that goal. I want to feel good, increase my fitness. I want to lose some weight. I want to build some muscle, okay? So those three are always dominant. Um, and then what I realized, let's say you come to me and you stay, stay with me at Bang Tao for, for a month, we're going to achieve some of those goals. Um, and then you go back home. Life kicks back in. You have different priorities, which are very likely not training twice a day. You have a job. You have a wife, kids. And um, after your work day, you might prioritize dinner with your family instead of going to the gym. So what happened is a year later, you come back. And 
we kind of start all over again, which made my job a little bit frustrating because I put my time and heart into you to help you and we have a little bit of success. A year later, you come back and, and that success is gone. Ground zero. Let's Ground start, zero. start again. So you come to me again. You have the same goal. You want to lose some fat, build some muscle, increase your fitness. Good. Now I have that goal and I saw a problem. And the problem was um, you're not continuing your training for whatever reason. But I had to think about what would be the way to solve that problem. So I had to find a simple and effective method that I can pass on to you that you can take home and continue training. And for me, I said that at the beginning, when I do a PT, I always try to educate, give you the understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. And I realized the, a sling trainer, something like a TRX, and a kettlebell is what can replace a full gym. I think every man, every woman should have a kettlebell at home. And if you want to get a, a sling trainer, that would be a good idea too. So I used those two tools and primarily the kettlebell to teach you, educate you, help you to buy a kettlebell at home. And then when you, can, then when you went home, you can continue your training. And your training lasts somewhere between 20 and not more than 45 minutes. And um, so suddenly I taught you something, which is how to train and control the kettlebell. And now you can go home, continue what we started, and a year later I see you again, and we don't have to start at zero. We are, you are actually a little bit better than the time you left me. And um, that was the main reason why I picked the kettlebell and, uh, and opened that company, Kettlebells and Conditioning Asia, because I wanted to give that tool uh, to my clients, to the people to yeah, take responsibility for their own training without having a coach around, which is not really cheap, or, or having to go to a gym day after day. Is there a program you've created as well, or is this kind of going to be customized on the client that's coming in and their needs? Um, both. So, yes, they are, they are a customized program, but the kettlebell is a very old tool. Here, just push your mic down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, just, it'll just so it looks... You see how it on the film? Yeah, yeah, down, yeah. Down, 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 down. Just so it won't cover, so it won't be up here. There you go. Yeah, looks. It'll look better later. So the kettlebell is 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 a pretty old tool. It's not nothing new. So there's a lot of good um, books you can read and um, a lot of good sources yeah. where you can learn from. And there's a lot of science behind it that shows what works and and uh, what what works a little better. So everyone, like, they're coming in. You kind of have like a, like a, a general. Um, let's say a workout program that people could adopt just maybe more direction in the exercises. But if I'm coming in as maybe a, a PT and I approach you, are you going to be like creating a custom program for me or how does that work? Um, well, I will deliver what you want. Okay. So if we, if we talk about a general program, I think if everyone steps up and buys themselves a kettlebell, a kettlebell swing and a push-up brings you a very, very long way. Mm. Push-ups on your toes, on your knees, it doesn't matter. But um, I just posted the other day a very simple uh, framework. You, set a, you take your watch, you set a timer, and every two minutes, so minute zero, minute two, minute four, minute six, you start your set, and your set is 10 swings followed by 10 push-ups. Takes you round about, on average, 30 seconds. That means you get 90 seconds of rest, and you continue can obviously adapt those numbers uh, to your needs and um, for me it's the perfect superset like the kettlebell swing pretty much trains every muscle in your body beside your triceps and your chest and that's what the push-up gives you and do we need to be using a heavy heavier kettlebell like if i'm going back home and i'm taking on this uh, program with yourself in thailand and and i head back home should i be buying a few different weighted ones or is there kind of a like a let's call it the holy grail of kettlebell that could fit maybe obviously it's going to be to the person mm -hmm. like a, a, a that ideal weight that okay maybe use one or two and that should cover everything um obviously in or maybe apply it to yourself of what what you're using yeah so in an ideal world that would look like my world, because kettlebell is my thing. I have everything at home from 12 kg to 44 kg, yeah. which is a big question to ask for your customer, for your client to, to buy. Because you can roundabout calculate $3, $3.50 per kg you buy in a kettlebell. So 
if you buy a 24 kg kettlebell, you should get it somewhere between an average 75 to 90 90 dollars yeah. ish, right? Um, obviously, which kettlebell you choose is a little bit tailored towards your needs, but the goal of every man should be a 24 kg. Mm-hmm. You might not start with a 24, but that should be your mid or long term goal or goal that you that you control and handle a 24. Um, and for every woman, the 16. Like if you if you do that, you you're pretty strong and fit. And what are some of the movements they're going through besides just the kettlebell swing? I mean, are they doing the clean press we've done in class before? <clears throat> so you you now referring to my um, yeah certification, right? So uh, me and kettlebells and conditioning Asia, we have a few certification programs, and the level one is called control the kettlebell. So control the kettlebell gives you all fundamental lifts in kettlebell. There are a lot of fancy lifts, but the fundamentals are the two-arm swing and the one-arm swing. The clean, that means bringing the kettlebell to the shoulder, uh, chest level, supporting it there. That's a very important position. We call that the front rack position. From there, you can now start squatting or going overhead. That means pressing, push pressing, uh, which would be fundamental exercise five and six. And then there's the snatch where you bring the kettlebell in one motion from ground to overhead and you continue this. So those are the fundamental exercises I'm teaching at that seminar. And um, the design of the seminar and the exam of the seminar is tailored towards everyone. So you could join that seminar, that that certification program, without being the, the fittest and strongest in the room. Like my mom can join and she can pass the exam because... It's about controlling the kettlebell, not performing on the highest level. So my mom can pick, okay, she wants to do the exam with 8 kg, great. That is part of controlling the kettlebell. If my mom would pick 32 kg, then she would very likely fail because her first decision was already wrong. Because my aim is, again, to educate you, to give everything you need into your own hands so you could train at home, um, which is making the right decision when it comes to the weight. And then I want to see that you control the kettlebell so you stay in safe. Interesting. On, on a side note, let's uh, the history of the kettlebell. Let's talk about the history of the kettlebell. Wh- where where does the name come from? Who invented it? How did this all get started? So uh, it's a that is a big question, and there are, there are many stories. Um, it's it's coming from Russia. That's what everyone is saying, and um, let's believe that. The kettlebell back then apparently was, uh, I think you say, counterweight for a scale. Right. So let's say you and me, we are tattooed sailmans. We're working on a harbor and we put something on the scale. And we had to measure how heavy that is. So we have counterweights. And it was a weight with a handle, right? So we were measuring what, what we, were, we were putting on the scale. And after the work is done, you and me, we have some beers and suddenly we want to find out who's the stronger dude. So we were taking those weights and started pressing it overhead and we both could press it. Okay, let's see who can do it more often. And um, that is the the short background story of where that training method and that, yeah, that competition style came from. Who can bring that weight, that counterweight overhead or swing it more often. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, that makes sense. And then from that, is there a certain like milestone in the world of kettlebells where, you know, it went away from just this like folklore of, you know, Russians maybe by the, the Caspian Sea ripping kettlebells and, you know, having a drunken competitions of vodka and beer to um, where it actually became, wait a minute, let's turn this into an actual genuine exercise. Was there someone like that really kickstarted it or is there any one that's taking the claim of the kettlebell? Yes. So um, there is the, the father of the, okay. the kettlebell training. Uh, Pavel Tatsulin, I hope I pronounced his name right. Tatsulin. And where is he from? Uh, Russia. Okay. Um, awesome guy. Like back then, he was yeah one of my heroes. I was reading his books and and um, and uh, he made pretty much a system. He systemized the kettlebell training, so we're not just getting drunk and swinging stuff overhead. Not saying every sale man get drunk and swing <laughs> stuff overhead, right? But <laughs> but I assume that's that's how we guys work, right? We drink and then we want to find out who's the bigger man 
Anyway, so he um, was apparently the one who first uh, systemized it and brought it to the public. I'm sure. What year was this? Or oh, if you I, I, I can't recall that. I would say like he's he should be like, uh, I in mean, his 60s or late late 50s, early 60s. I mean, are you talking 70s, 80s, 90s? Um, so when it comes to uh, America, it was probably 80 and 90s. Okay. I assume I'm uh, I'm not sure about this. I can I can recall or research that for you. But um, he was the one who, who came to America and brought it over. And, um, yeah, bring the, a system of, of, yeah, systemized kettlebell training to, to the people. Uh, yeah, he was always saying power to the people. He and wanted now you're seeing Joe, Joe Rogan, I think, is really taking it, uh, mm. making it more uh, public and popular as, as well now and with his company on it. Yeah, and they do different yeah. kettlebell designs. Do you see yourself, like, what is the goal on the business side? of um of kettlebells and now i know you're launching your company you're yeah. launching the uh, the certification processes um would you be moving into your own uh, selling your own kettlebell your own product lines what do you vision for yourself um so the vision is of course i want to have it all at one point um today i start with the one-on-one -on -one education my class is at bang Tau muay thai where i want to give people the fundamentals the main things they need and then the certification progress for everyone who wants to dive a little bit deeper and again take responsibility for their own training. Level one, control the kettlebell would be the ideal certification. Now obviously my, my company just started, we are months old and um, having my own kettlebell line, shipping kettlebells from China to Thailand is very expensive. You need storage places and that is that is a milestone I want to reach a little later. But for now, I want to, yeah, let's say conquer Asia. I want to I want to go to Bangkok, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, and so on and so on, and and offer my services there and and bring kettlebell education and and training to everyone who's interested to learn. Yeah, and it's it's a good start. I mean, a lot of stuff. It's born out of the we'll call it the C word, so YouTube doesn't attack us. But uh, the current situation that we've pass yeah. through um <clears throat> now just kind of before we wrap it up um this class you said it will be starting in october yes um we're gonna kick it back to this camera and I, if you can just let everyone know not just not obviously not just for bangtown muay thai and mma where they can find you in october but even about yourself where we can find content on you on your if you have a youtube channel you're mm -hmm. running on instagram and just in general if anyone wants to reach out and connect with you how they could go about doing that uh that camera right there on yes the far right <laughs> so um yeah how to find me first of all you find me on instagram youtube i uh, just type down peter fornick f-o-r-n-e-c-k um, that's where you can contact me i try to answer pretty fast but you know how it is on social media um, for everyone who makes it out here to Thailand to book it, um, as Brendan just said, I'm going to wor work at Bang Tau Muay Thai offering a class. For now, we're going to increase it closer to the high season, but for now it's going to be 12.30 every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And don't be scared about swinging kettlebells. The design of the kettlebell is for all levels. So from beginner to advanced, you're going to get uh, the most out of this. If you want to see a little bit more, just search me on YouTube, Peter Fornick. I have a big uh, kettlebell library there. You can just copy what you see, and I try to deliver more workouts you can just do at home. Perfect. So, yeah, again, that's over at Bangtao Muay Thai and yeah. MMA. It's in the Bangtao area of Phuket, <laughs> which is the southern part of Bangtao near Surin Beach. Um, so, again, if you're coming there, it, I mean, you have those options. You got the SNC, you got the hit in the morning. Obviously, you have the MMA stuff, Muay Thai, boxing, jiu-jitsu. But now they're adding the, the kettlebell classes. I personally, myself, will come be checking them out. It actually works well for me because it's at lunch. So I can, uh, even if I miss the hit, you can grab that at lunch. And to be honest, it, it's not that hot here. You get used to it. Maybe it's hard because we've been here a while. Um, we're going to wrap this episode up. Uh, I think all the information will be left with links in the descriptions. Do not forget to subscribe. Uh, I think it's something like 80% of the people that watch are not subscribed. So I don't know what you're doing. You got to subscribe. Um, otherwise I'm going to start, uh, blocking you. No, I don't know. I'm just making this up. Okay. Um, without, uh, me rambling anymore. Thanks a lot.
Peter. Um, if there's you. anything else you want to add that you might have forgot, just let them know. If not, we will uh, end it there. Yeah. What I can say, guys, is um, we talked at the beginning of, of about dreaming and living the dream. Like, don't be afraid of, of trying things out. Um, it sounds very big to buy a one-way ticket, but a one-way ticket can be a return ticket a week later. And um, if you if you never done something like martial art tourism or fitness holiday, uh, come see us at uh, in Phuket in Thailand at Bang Thao Muay Thai, and I will be happy to pass on my knowledge to you, teach you, and then you can take some responsibility for your own training and health. Absolute wisdom there, guys. So eat that up. Come to Thailand. At least jump on the plane. Take that chance. Um, I've, as all of us have done, and now we've all been here for quite some time. Um, so that it wraps up another episode. Um, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff, and we're out. Bye.